right, guys. All right, guys. Welcome to lab number six. We're going to be talking about animals moving forward. You guys did fairly well on the practical. The biggest thing uh, that students had an issue with, with um, was writing the specific class or order of the organism or plant or whatever it may have been um, instead of the domain. So if the question had asked for the domain, which there are three domains of life, eukarya, prokarya, and archaea. Um, so if it had have asked for that or if it had have asked for one of the five kingdoms of life, like which kingdom does this organism belong to, and say the organism in front of you is a dinoflagellate, and you put, um, you know, dinozoa, or you put, um, uh, like, the specific group that it belonged to, instead of putting protista or protist, um, then that question was marked incorrect. So um, I did give back question for uh, credit for the lily pollen tetrad question because we didn't go over that. So everybody got credit for that one. Um, go through your exams and make sure uh, there weren't any grading mistakes on there. Um, I tried to grade them all fairly uh, and quickly. So just reach out to me if you have any questions about that. So we're going to start talking about animal biodiversity. In lab six, we're going to discuss the cnidarians, which are jellyfish, sea anemones, and sea fans. And then we're also going to talk about periphera first. So periphera are our sponges. Um, you can see where we're going to be moving forward in the next couple weeks. We're going to have some dissections and opportunities for you to uh, come into lab in person and see those organisms in person, dissected, uh, and I will let you guys know when we end up doing that. I believe we're just going to do labs 8 and 9 in person. Um, so this week's lab, there are no in-person opportunities, and I don't think there will be any in-person opportunities for next week either. So the animal kingdom can be divided into two sub-kingdoms. The first one is Parazoa, uh, which is exclusively the phylum Periphera. So remember guys, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That is the order from most broad to most specific. So we're gonna be dealing primarily with phyla names here. So this phylum um, under the subkingdom Parazona is Periphera which are our sponges. These are the earliest organisms in the animal kingdom, and they do not have any true tissues. The other subkingdom sub that we can um, talk about is eumetazoa. So these are all the other animals. So any animal that is not a sponge, okay? So we can divide this group up by their body symmetry, whether they're radial or bilateral as well as the way they develop um, their embryos. So whether they're a protostome or a deuterostome. And we'll talk about what that means uh, later on. So here you can see me with a giraffe um, and a monkey. And then there's my favorite animal, uh, a thylacine, which are now extinct, unfortunately, because we hunted them out in the 1940s. It was really sad. So phylum periphera, these are our sponges. So what you need to know is that they lack true tissues. They are the most primitive of multicellular invertebrates. And they're sessile, so they don't move around, okay? Um, they breathe, feed, reproduce, and excrete waste by pumping water. They're also asymmetrical. There's absolutely no symmetry whatsoever, okay? So they're all different shapes and sizes. And they don't have any muscles, nerves, or internal organs at all. So the anatomy of a sponge is a little interesting. Remember these guys, the coanocytes that we talked about in that um, super group, Epistaconta? Well, they actually line the inside of sponges. So these flagella rotate like a boat motor and actually are responsible for water flow inside of sponges. So... 
some important words here. You have what are called ostia, which is not pictured here, but they're holes in which the inflow of water is, um, so water flows in through the ostia, and then water flows out of the sponge through the osculum, okay? Um, so the word ostia is noticed here, or noted here, and osculum is the exit. Um, and then coenocytes just line the inside, okay? So those are the most important things. So structural components of a sponge, uh, sponges have spicules, which can be either made out of calcium carbonate, our friend, or silica, our other friend that we talked about before. Um, these are just for defense um, mechanism and provide a bit of structure as well. And then the other material is spongin, which is a protein, it's collagen, um, that the spicules are inside of. So this is like the, the sponge's skeleton. They don't have a true skeleton, um, but it's super soft and flexible, okay? So there are three main body structures, body types, okay, that you're going to need to know. These are going to be practical questions. So let's go through each. We're going to start with the most simple, which is ascanoid. So an ascon or ascanoid sponge is very simple, has the coanocytes on the inside lining the sponge's seal, okay, that's the inner cavity, usually only has one osculum or exit point with many ostea or entry points, okay? So the singular for ostea would be an osteum, okay? So one exit, lots of um, entrances, okay? Our next most advanced uh, or most complex, uh, which is cut off here a little bit, but I'll tell you, psychon or psychonoid sponges usually still only have one osculum, lots of ostea, and this time the sponge seal is folded to increase the surface area. So you have folded sponge seal with all the coanocytes lining the inside as well, okay? And lastly, we have leucon or leuconoid sponges. These are the most complex body plan of sponges, and they have lots of folding in their sponge seal, lots of pockets uh, with the coanocytes kind of in these little pockets like this, um, lots of ostea, and sometimes they'll actually have multiple oscula also. So they'll have more than one osculum or exit point for the water. So in your lab manual, you're gonna need to draw a Scypha grantia. So this is the slide that you're gonna draw. So label what type of canal system does this sponge have? Do you think after going through those, notice that the sponge seal is folded a little bit. Uh, you can't really see the coanocytes very well. Um, these are coanocytes, but you just can't quite differentiate them um, as that great. Uh, and then you can label the things it asks you to here. So just draw these um, and label what you need to. You're also going to need to draw gemules. Uh, these are just like an asexual reproduction method for sponges. So you can read about them here and talk about how they're formed. So reproduction and sponges. What happens is the sperm from sponges are expelled into the water and engulfed by the coanocytes. So that sperm's transported to an egg, can be housed with inside the sponge. Um, you really just need to know that these organisms are sexual and they're asexual. So sponges frequently exhibit fragmentation and budding and then gemule re uh, production as before. So those are the buns on the, the, um, the buds on the inside of the sponges. So now we've talked about sponges broadly, the, the entire phylum of sponges, and now we're gonna talk about the three classes of sponges. So don't forget, kingdom, phylum, class, family, genus, species. So we're getting a little bit more specific here, but there are three that you need to know and we're gonna go through each one. So we're gonna start with the calcera sponges, Cal calcia spongiae, is the class name. 
So these sponges have spicules made out of calcium carbonate, just like the name would imply. Um, their spicules don't have any uh, hollow canals. And these are typically small honeycomb-like structure. Um, in your lab manual, you're going to need to draw the grantia. So what did I say that they were uh, composed of, right? What are they made out of? The next class is demospongae. Um, so these sponges are made out of spongin primarily. Um, their spicules are made out of silica. So these are primarily 90% of all sponges. And they look like this frequently. So demospongae, if I would give you one of these and it didn't have any spicules, these are so like a bath sponge, what would be left? What is the other structural component that I just mentioned? And lastly, uh, the class hexactinolita. So hexactinolita is uh, re referred to also as glass sponges because they look like glass. Uh, they're also made out of silica, so which is basically glass for that reason. So what are they made out of? I just mentioned, so write that down. Uh, so now we're going to talk about phylum Cnidaria, which are jellyfish, corals, sea anemones, and hydras, and sea fans. So jellyfish, um, and, or cnidarians in general, have two true tissues, um, and they also have two body types that you'll see. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But the true tissues, if an organism has two tissue layers, that means it's diploblastic. And those layers are going to be the endoderm and ectoderm. So if the organism's diploblastic, it'll have both of those, and it is lacking the mesoderm, okay? So before we talked about sponges, they don't have any tissues at all, all right? Body structure, um, Typically just a sac uh, containing a gastrovascular cavity, uh, so like this here, and um, that single opening is the mouth and the anus. These guys also have radial symmetry, meaning that you can cut them any type of way. So notice how before our um, sponges are asymmetric. They don't have any symmetry whatsoever. And the two common body forms that you'll see um, are uh, the polyp stage and the medusa stage, which we'll talk about shortly. So polyp stage, um, tubular body with a mouth surrounded by tentacles, okay, typically sessile. They can't move around at all, so they're attached to some substratum. Um, whereas the medusa stage is free swimming, can move around wherever. This is typically the jellyfish that you see, okay? So here are both of those, and you need to know those. So let's talk about cnidocytes. Cnidarians get their name because they have um, these specialized cells called cnidocytes. And uh, this entire thing here is a cnidocyte. On the inside, we have a nematocyst. So the nematocyst is the actual stinging organelle that shoots out, has its little barb and thread, and that is the self-defense mechanism that jellyfish have. That's why they sting. So jellyfish and other cnidarians can reproduce asexually as well as sexually. So they can exhibit fragmentation, budding, um, if they're in polyp form. They can split right down the middle um, if they're in medusa form. Sexually, uh, they do broadcast spawning, so they'll just like release their sperm and egg into the water. Uh, they can do brooding where the sperm's released and the egg's inside of the organism. And then they also switch frequently between polyp and medusa body form. So here is the life cycle of a cnidarian. We go from a polyp colony to a medusa bud, and then male and female medusa can mate sexually, uh, egg and sperm. Then we get a zygote, the blastula, which is our embryonic cell, and then swimming larvae go back to developing into a, po uh, a polyp, and then we can make some more medusa buds. So there are four classes of cnidarians that you're going to need to know, and we're going to go through each of them. So the first one is hydrozoa. So an example would be the Portuguese man o' war or a hydra. So here's a little hydra down here. Here's Portuguese man o' war up top. So 
Portuguese man it kind of looks like a Medusa stage organism, but it's actually uh, a bunch of polyps hanging down from a float. Pretty interesting. Um, so these are solitary organisms, but they're also uh, colonial, so they live in a colony. Um, most of these have a polyp and Medusa life stage, but some of them only have one. For example, this hydra is only found in polyp stage, so it's going to be attached to some substratum. So in your uh, lab exercises, I asked you, what embryonic layers give rise to the two tissue layers in Cnidaria? So um, what are the two tissue layers in Cnidarians? Okay, so list those. Do you see any signs of a skeleton or support system in Cnidarians? How do you think the body's supported? So if we go back to the slide here, you'll see they have this thing called a mesoglea. That is how the body's supported, okay? Um, other than that, they don't have any sort of skeleton, all right? So what appendages, if any, are present? All right, so list some appendages. Are reproductive buds present? You can talk about that. Um, gas exchange, how's that accomplished, do you think? Um, and are there organs for excretion? Well, not really. They have a mouth and an anus in the same spot, right? So you're going to need to draw this polyp and label it. So how many openings does it have? Well, I just said only one, right? Um, and then you can observe this here. This has everything labeled out on the hydra. So again, how many tissue layers do cnidarians have? Um, Here's the abelia colony. You'll need to label this, draw it, and label. Um, and next class, so Scyphozoa. These are our cannonball jellyfish, jellyfish that we typically see. Medusa is going to be the dominant life stage form in Scyphozoans. So you will pretty much only see them in this free-floating stage. They have what are called gastric ciri in their guts and these um are pretty much the finger-like uh nematocyst bearing projections that's how they uh, have their self-defense and they digest their food so in your lab exercises it just asks you um, what's the body form that they primarily exhibit and that's going to be medusa body form Next class is Cubozoa. Uh, they're called this because they are kind of cube-shaped, um, box-shaped, right? They have what are called ocelli. Um, so ocelli are just camera-like eyes, pretty much, that help the organism differentiate um, between light and dark environments. Um, they have those gastric ciri for digestion. They're super strong swimmers. And these are generally fatal organisms. Um, if they sting a human, uh, you don't typically come back from that. So what are the ocelli used for in animals? Well, differentiating between light and dark. Lastly, our class Anthozoa. So these are our coral sea anemones and sea fans. Um, there's no Medusa body form in this, strictly polyp body form. And they reproduce primarily by broadcast spawning or brooding. Um, so sexually, they have a larval, a larval stage of development, um, fun fact. And then the biggest thing here is that we have zooxanthellae, which is actually a protist that lives, um, it's, it's usually a dinoflagellate that lives inside of the organism. It has a symbiotic relationship where, um, the zooxanthellae, um, receive protection and nutrients and carbon dioxide, and they also provide food to the, um, the anthozoan. So whether it's a coral, so in a coral's case, um, they would be providing, the zooxanthellae would be providing food to the coral. In return, they get protection, nutrients, carbon dioxide. So zooxanthellae, um, what are they and what is coral bleaching? Here's a little diagram on coral bleaching and how you can tell whether a reef system is healthy or bleached. 
Lastly, I'm going to need you to map these traits onto the tree. Um, so on that tree, it's the last page of your lab exercises. You are going to need to retain this and resubmit it for every lab moving forward. So I need you to make sure to put those traits on there um, as they appear here and make sure you are submitting that moving forward so you get full credit. A couple things to note. Um, on March 21st, you're going to, so next Sunday, you're going to need to turn in your quiz six and lab six exercises. Um, Sunday, April 4th, your species spotlight paper and Adobe Spark page, the group Adobe Spark page are going to be due. Species spotlight paper is an individual assignment and that is also due on Sunday, April 4th. So make sure you have made those corrections um, from your feedback that you got from the Learning Center um, and make sure you're talking to your group and everyone is completing a fair amount of work on the website. All right, please reach out if you have any questions at all. I am here for you.